Buddha's first teaching was the Noble Eightfold Path. His last teaching was the Noble Eightfold Path. And again and again throughout his teaching career, he kept focusing there. You know, we have this tendency to think that he didn't tell us everything in the path. There's much more to be figured out. Well, of course, there are a lot of details in the path that he didn't tell. And a lot of his other teachings are details in the path. But there is that tendency to think that there's something else we need to know. For instance, when we hear about stream entry and how it cuts three fetters, we figure we've got to figure out what those fetters are so that we can cut them and get there. But the fetters are cut by stream entry. They're the result. Think of that time when Sariputta the Wanderer had gained the Dharma Eye, which is another term for stream entry. After a very short teaching from Venerable Asaji, he goes back and sees his friend Moggallana, who was also a wanderer at the time. Moggallana sees him and says, your complexion is bright, your faculties are bright. Could you have seen the deathless? And Sariputta says, yes. That's what you see, that's what the Dharma Eye sees, is the deathless. And that experience is then what cuts through the fetters. Because you see not only the deathless, but you see how you got there. And you realize that it was through your own efforts, through your discernment. And what you've seen is outside of space and time, something that cannot be touched by change. And there's this weird sense, well, it's always been there. Even though always doesn't really apply to the deathless, because it is outside of time. But you know it's not going to change. And in stepping outside of time, you see back and you realize that your experience of time didn't start with the day in which you were born or the day in which you were conceived this time around. It goes way, way back. And you realize that in that experience, there are no aggregates. There is no form, no feeling, no perception, no fabrication of anything, and no consciousness of the six senses. Yet there is an awareness. As a result, there's no tendency to want to identify yourself with any of the aggregates ever again. You still have a lingering sense of self that sort of hovers around the aggregates, but you would never hold to the view that the aggregates are you or yours, or that you're in the aggregates or the aggregates are in you. That's how that fetter gets cut, the fetter of self-identity views. Of course, doubt about the Buddha, that gets cut. Seeing the deathless, you realize that what the Buddha said was true. It really does put an end to suffering. You've had a glimpse. As the canon says in several places, you've actually had a direct experience, a direct knowledge of Nibbāna. That's what guarantees your conviction in the Buddha. You know that sutta of the, the elephant's footprint? The question is the hunter who sees big footprints in the forest. Does he really know that there are the footprints of a big bull elephant? Well, not really, because there are dwarf females with big feet. But it looks promising. So he follows them and sees scratch marks up in the trees. Is that proof that that's a big bull elephant there? Well, not necessarily, because there are tall females with tusks. It might be theirs. It's only when you follow the footprints and you finally see the big bull elephant that you know for sure. Okay, that's the big bull elephant that you're looking for because you want a bull elephant who can do a lot of work. The same way it's when you've seen the deathless, you realize the Buddha really knew what he's talking about. There is an end to suffering. And it's done by following the path. That part of the path is composed of precepts and composed of practices. But your relationship to precepts and practices also changes. Sometimes this fetter is defined as rituals and rites. 
And some people say, well, I don't have any rituals. I'm done with that one. But people still have a lot of habits that they hold to. You realize that the habits you have cannot guarantee awakening. There has to be an act of discernment that sees through not only the things outside, but also what you've been doing. Because what have you been doing? You've been doing the path. So even though we may know ahead of time what the fetters are, that's not going to cut them. It's through doing the path that things get cut. It's through doing the path that gets to the experience that cuts through things. That would be a better way of putting it. The same old Noble Eightfold Path that all comes together, that's what the Buddha said, is the stream. Actually, sorry, Buddha said that, but the Buddha confirmed what he said. So we don't have to anticipate anything else aside from the path. Do the path. Focus on what you're doing. Reflect on what you're doing. And that combination of commitment and reflection is what takes you. There's something that's beyond the path. After all, the path is fabricated. You do put it together. But it can take you to something that's unfabricated. This is one of the big paradoxes in the Buddhist teachings, which has been a stumbling block for a lot of people. You hear it again and again through different periods of Buddhist history in different places. How can something fabricated lead to something unfabricated? We've got to think of the path. The path doesn't cause the things that it leads to. But by following the path, you get there. And following the path, you're not just doing what you're told, you're reflecting on what you're doing. And you're gaining some discernment into this process of fabrication, of how the mind puts things together here in the present moment. You see it as you're doing concentration. You begin to see a thought form that could pull you away. But if your mindfulness and alertness are good, you realize you don't have to go there. But you can see the steps by which it happens. And then you turn around and you reflect on the concentration itself. It's the same sort of thing. This is how fabrication happens. This is how things originate in the mind. Because that's where the problem is. As the Buddha said, the cause of suffering is right here. And so you want to learn how to observe your mind in action. And you might want to say, I'd like to see something else beside my mind in action. I don't like what I see. You've got to learn how to really look at what you're doing. It's one of the reasons why we're trying to do good things, act on only skillful intentions, because that makes the mind a lot easier to watch. And as you watch what the mind is doing, you begin to see that its doing goes very deep, even deeper than you might have imagined. Because that relates to the expression of what's seen in, through the Dharma eye. Whatever subject origination is all subject to cessation. You have to stop and think, what kind of experience would lead to that idea spontaneously appearing in the mind? Now, sometimes it's translated as whatever arises passes away. It makes it sound like, well, you finally accepted the principle of inconstancy. Part of your mind resisted it, but now you say, yes, I think I really, that's really true. Well, that kind of realization is not going to shake the earth. It's not going to shake up your mind. What shakes up your mind is as the path leads you toward the deathless you begin to realize how much you've been shaping your experience. Because it doesn't say whatever, is, whatever arises, it says whatever is subject to origination. Origination means something caused. And the cause comes from within the mind. So basically what it's saying is whatever is caused by the mind is going to cease. And that insight appears spontaneously again when you've seen something that is not caused by the mind. That doesn't cease. 
whereas everything else that was caused by the mind does cease in that experience. Which is why you don't have to be primed ahead of time to be told, well, this is what you're going to see at stream entry. The experience of the deathless is what leads you to that conclusion, because you saw that this was not originated in the mind. And you know because you've gotten really good at observing the mind. And you also watch as everything that was originated, anything that has anything to do with the six senses, five aggregates, just all falls away. And what's left is something that you know is not originated, but it doesn't cease. Which is why it's called the deathless. This all happens, though, when the Eightfold Path comes together. So it keeps coming back to the Eightfold Path. You read all about the, the Wings to Awakening, all those different lists. And it sounds like you have different paths you can choose from. And there is an element of choice as you practice, but in every case, the Buddha says, how do you develop, say, the seven factors for awakening? How do you develop the four bases for success? The four establishings of mindfulness, the five strengths, the five faculties. It's through developing the Noble Eightfold Path. You want to get all the factors to come together. In the beginning, they sound like eight fairly random things. But as you practice, you begin to see that they all come together. And John Lee wrote a book on the Eightfold Path, and his explanations of the different factors blurred the lines between the factors, and he did that intentionally. Because virtue has an organic relationship with right concentration. Right concentration has an organic relationship with discernment. they all come together in this element of being very attentive to what your mind is doing, what its intentional actions are, what the results are. And now you keep refining, refining, refining what you're doing. And don't get so refined that it leads you to something that's not done. So when you wonder, why isn't your practice developing as it should? Well, you don't have to look anywhere else. Look into the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. Try to figure out which one is lacking. And John Lee points out that the path is kind of like building a bridge across a river. The principles of the precepts, the virtue, they're not that hard. The principles of discernment are not that hard either. It's the concentration that requires a lot of work. In other words, the factors of right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. That's where most of our focus is going to be. But don't forget the other elements as well. As you practice following the precepts, what are the precepts demand of you? That you be really clear about what your intentions are. You have to be mindful to keep the precept in mind. You have to be alert to watch your actions to make sure they stay in line with the precept. You have to be ardent in trying to do this well. Because there will be times when it's going to be really easy to break the precepts. Your old habits will push you in that direction. And you've got to say no. You've got to make an effort. Well, these three qualities, mindfulness, alertness, ardency, these are all qualities of right mindfulness. Right mindfulness is basically the Buddha's instructions on how to get the mind into right concentration. So all the factors do come together. As the Buddha once said of his teachings, there's nothing lacking and there's nothing in excess. So try to be virtuous and discerning in your concentration. Try to be discerning and concentrated as you practice virtue. And as they all come together like this, that's when they take you to something really special. You have that glimpse of what the Buddhist goal is. An analogy they give in the canon is like standing at the edge of a well. You see that there's water down in the well, but you haven't totally plunged into it. 
But it's enough to know, okay, there's water there. When you've seen the deathless, there's more work to be done. But it really rearranges your mind to have seen the deathless. That's what cuts the fetters without your having known about the fetters beforehand. That's what leads to that conclusion that whatever subject to origination is all subject to cessation. Without ever having heard that, you'd still come to that conclusion. And it's at that point that what it says you actually start your genuine training. So right now we're training to get into the into the real training. And keep your focus here. Run on the Eightfold Path. Bring it together in your mind. And it'll take you to where you want to go.